the interesting effects of multiple beam interference are hard to see mathematically based on that expression, r squared times two minus two cosine delta over r to the fourth minus r squared two cosine delta plus one, a little hard to see there. I'm gonna show it to you graphically and then maybe we'll look again mathematically. So first let's just see if our new expression is accurate. So here is the old result where we only considered the 4%, the almost 4%, and we ignored everything else. This is the uh, uh, 0.16 I naught cosine squared delta that I showed you before, and you see it sort of loosely and gently adjusts from no reflection to 16% uh, reflection as we go through phase. So we can vary phase, for example, by varying wavelength. Okay. That was the result. Everything was fine. We could see colored fringes in a microscope slide. Everything's fine. Now what we're going to do is plot this new expression for the same thing and see what happens. There it is. Now we have considered the initial reflection 4%, the second reflection almost 4%, and all these little reflections. And they're small, but we add them up, there's an infinite number of them. We did it for the same parameters, the same thickness, um, the same index. We did it for normal incidence, and we plugged in a reflection coefficient that you would get for this uh, index, uh, about 0.2. And you can see the effects are astounding. The amplitude goes down just a little bit. Look at that, it's above 15% here. It goes below 15% here. Here, it was hitting a minimum just past 500 nanometers. And now look at that, it's at about 490 nanometers. Pretty exciting. Well, it's not really that exciting. So the point is for just a piece of glass, index 1.5, this was a pretty good approximation. It's actually true for a piece of glass that pretty much everything is defined or is set by these first two reflections. Even though there's an infinite number of those other reflections, they're too small to add up. So when you add them all up, it has essentially no effect. The more complicated formula gives almost the same answer as a simple formula. But now, let's do something else. Now, let's make R higher. I don't care how, we're just going to make it higher. We haven't talked about what happens with Fresnel's equations at a metal, but basically if you put a metal on here, you can get a little r instead of 0.2, you can get up to 0.5 or 0.9 or get as high as you want. Okay, we didn't do the math, it comes out, uh, the result for here is the same. So don't worry about why, but we're gonna set little r to about 0.9, okay? Little r is very high now. So if little r is very high, this is what the double beam formula does. And this is sort of what you would expect. If little r is high, this reflection is very strong, not much gets through, it's well reflected here, and maybe it gets through decent there, but now this beam is much stronger than this beam because the reflectance is so high, the, reflect, the coefficient of reflection is so high. So that's why there's still interference, but it is largely muted, right? because you're pretty much looking at this beam with a little bit of interference by that beam. So that's what the double beam formula predicts. And here is what the full formula that includes all the infinite terms looks like. Okay, now that's different, right? So now we know that this one is huge, small, 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 but you have an army of small reflectances. Their amplitudes are bigger. Less light is gonna go through. So something can happen. And right here, something really big happens, right? So let's make sure we understand this. At most wavelengths, this essentially reflects all the light, okay? So you get your big reflectance due to this, and these just don't get together and do much. Either they're too small or they destructively interfere, not much happens. But at this one magic wavelength, suddenly your reflections, your reflectance is going to zero. So basically at this magic wavelength, all these little guys are adding up and they're all adding up in a way that destructively interferes with that one. Remember, this is that alpha ray, I called it. And all these little ones, if they all add up together, all go destructive on that one, they can drive the reflectance to zero. And it happens at a very, specific wavelength. It has a very sharp effect when you vary phase. So you can vary the wavelength to vary the phase difference between all these. You can vary the angle to see the phase difference between all these. But it is a strong effect in phase. And this is why when you get into multiple reflections, you can actually have interference effects that are very sharp. This is why in that optics catalog, you can have interference filters that only uh, pass a very narrow band. Okay? They have lots of better ways of doing it than this, but it always involves uh, strong reflection so that you get many, many, many reflectances, reflections. Okay, let me try to give you an intuitive idea though of why this happens. 
you have to use phaser analysis. So I very rarely get into phasers and optics because it's usually not that necessary. But phasers are a way of keeping up with how sinusoids are going to add or interfere based on a vector. So this sinusoid, instead of writing it as a sinusoid, we just say it has an amplitude, that's the length of the vector, and it has a phase, that's the orientation of the vector, the angle of the vector. Right? So if I have uh, sinusoid A and B, these are both sines, and I represent them like this for their phase pointing up, and if they're in phase, then uh, we know they're going to add to a bigger sinusoid like that. It's constructive interference. And if the two vectors are at the same angle, then of course they're going to add to a big vector. Right? So these are called the phasers of this sinusoid. If you have a metaphase, say a sine, uh, and then a sine times a negative one, so pi out of phase, and of course those are going to add and give you destructive interference, nothing. And same thing, if you have your phaser here pointing up, a pi phase just is the phaser pointing down, add them like vectors and you get nothing. And you can do everything in between. Here's two sinusoids that are pi over two out of phase. So uh, a slight difference, we know whenever you add two sinusoids with any phase difference, you still get a sinusoid. Maybe you get zero, but you get a sinusoid. And in this case, you could figure it out by adding the two phasers like this and this and add them as vectors and it looks like that. So this angle would give you the new phase of that sinusoid. Okay. So this is a way to add up waves and sinusoids if you really want to. You don't have to do it this way. But this is the one time that it's really useful because now we're going to think about this interference condition in terms of phasers, all right? So let's look here. We're back to our just our, our reflection uh, uh, where the, the double beam formula was accurate, just a piece of glass. Reflectances are low, coefficients of reflection are low. So it just follows this sort of smooth curve here. And we could say a place where you get constructive interference between the front and the back is here. You get a strong reflection here. That's where the two phasers line up constructively. And a place where the reflectance is low was like here at 500. That's where the front might be, its phaser would be up, and the uh, reflection phaser from the back would be down. That's where they're out of phase. Right? So since you're only adding two, as we adjust the wavelength, we adjust delta, the phase factor, basically this one rotates. We can just define it that the front reflection is always up. Right? That's the alpha ray. And this one, as you adjust phase, this one just spins. Right? And so say if you go lambda over 20, so a 20th of, a wave of the wavelength off of the constructive interference, this turns a little bit and the phase, the amplitude isn't that different in the phase, it doesn't do much, right? So it's slightly less constructive and you get that, okay? That would be phasers applied to the double beam reflection. Let's look at phasers applied to this situation. So here we said this is a special place, right? This is where the front reflection is canceled by the huge infinite number of the little reflections, okay? And this place can only occur because all these are all out of phase with the front reflection, so they cancel it out. What is special, what makes this happen rapidly is the fact that these all rotate at different rates with respect to delta, okay? So if you were to move lambda over 20, this one will turn that much, this one will turn that much, this one will turn that much, this one will turn that much. And the reason is, remember, that they went through the film different amounts. Remember, each one of them got a delta. This was e to the minus j delta. This is e to the minus j2 delta. This is e to the minus j3 delta. So since they have a different delta, and as you change delta, this is the phase, this is how much they're going to rotate. In the, in the, of the phaser, so they rotate at different rates, okay? So if you go a set distance here, you're changing uh, a set difference in phase, they're gonna rotate different amounts because of these different rates in terms of how much they, their angle with respect to, with respect to phase. So that's the key, is the little ones can cancel the big one, but that condition is rapidly destroyed. You couldn't rapidly destroy it here because there's only two, right? But here, since there's a bunch of them, all it takes is a little bit of phase and they scramble. Yet one more way I can show you this is here. So here we're gonna watch an animation of what would happen to the phasers. Um, let's see, what happens to the phasers when we are in destructive interference in the case of double beam versus the case of multiple beam interference. So what you can imagine is we're just changing the wavelength. We are, we are moving down the spectrum and here we've hit the minimum where you get no reflection or you get no reflection. And 
we want to know what happens as we continue to scan the wavelength. Okay, so here we go. As we continue to scan the wavelength, this one slowly changes its set net product, right? So here it's still, it's coming down in amplitude a little bit. What's happened over here? Oh, we got a mess over here. Let's watch it again. We have these things, these have all added up just to cancel this one. And as soon as we change phase a little bit, they all start spinning. And now they're going to sum to pretty much zero, right? They're kind of randomized. So suddenly it's going to quickly go to some other level. And it's going to stay at that level because these aren't really doing anything. They're all just adding up to some random number and nothing's going to happen and nothing's going to happen. And now that one's canceling those and nothing happens and nothing happens. This one's slowly making its way to constructive, right? And then these, wait a minute now, something, something looks good here. Hold on. And wait a minute. There it is. Ah, right there. Suddenly they all canceled that one again, right? We started out canceling, eventually they'll add, eventually they'll cancel, but at all other times, it's just sort of a random mess. Okay. So that hopefully gives you a little bit of a physical idea of the difference between multiple beam and double beam interference. It's really all those little multiple beams can join together to, to beat the big beam.